And every week we go to the scriptures because it's there that the person and work of Christ are most clearly revealed. Our sermon this week will be from Isaiah 52, uh, verse 13, through chapter 53, verse 12. This fourth servant song uh, extends, starts in chapter 52 and continues through chapter 53. So hear the word of the Lord, Lord from Isaiah chapter 52, beginning in verse 13. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance, and his form beyond that of the children of mankind, so shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him, for that which has not been told them they see, and that which they have not heard they understand. Who has believed what he has heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that, is before, its, that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked, and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring, he shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Good morning. Good morning to you uh, gathering online with us uh, as well. As Paul said, this is the uh, fourth servant song uh, from Isaiah that we're looking at in the season of Advent. These four passages uh, where this figure known as the servants of the Lord shows up and appears. And this one, this fourth one, it's one of those seminal passages in the Bible. It's one of those passages that shaped and informed much of the New Testament's understanding of the cross, much of our understanding of what happened in that moment on the cross by Jesus for us is forged, formed right out of this passage. And so it is hard to express the gravity that I feel as we approach this text. But here's how I want to approach it today. Uh, because this, this passage, it, it could be preached, uh, I mean, honestly, any time of the year. June, September, Easter even. But it's not any time of the year. It's Advent. And so I, wanna, I want us to look at this passage in light of Advent. In, in light of Christmas coming. In light of the baby in a manger. And our question that I want us to answer today is a simple one. What do we learn from this passage about that baby 
in a manger. Our, our passage, our text today, it's, uh, it's a poem. Uh, it's got five stanzas, three verses each. And what I want to do is I, I just want to make our way one stanza at a time through it, pull out sort of the main thrust, sort of a main point of that stanza, take more of the, the fly over aerial view versus getting in and kind of bouncing tree to tree uh, in the text. And here's where it starts. Stanza one. That baby was God on a mission. Look at verse uh, 13. The middle of verse 13, 52, 13. Uh, it, it says, he shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. High and lifted up and shall be exalted. Th- these are two sides of one coin, if I could say it that way. And the Hebrew words high and lifted up, uh, they're used three other times in the Bible together. Three other times as a pair used together, all by Isaiah. Chapter 6, 33, 57, all three times. All three times in reference to God. All three times. High and lifted up, only a reference to God. Never of a king, never a warrior, never a prophet, only God. And then we have the other side of the coin. He shall be exalted. Um, well, if we went back to Isaiah 2, Isaiah 2 is, is going to warn against the exaltation of men. That in the middle of chapter 2, Isaiah is going to say, listen, at, at the haughtiness of men, as men are brought low, the Lord alone will be exalted. The Lord alone will be exalted. Put them together, a phrase used only of God, an exal- exaltation that belongs only to God. And what do we have? We have a baby in a manger who is the eternal, uncreated, divine one, the eternal, uncreated God. But not just any God, God on a mission. At the very beginning of 13, it opens like this. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. Um, Some of your translations, they they might say succeed or prosper, and so it might read something like, uh, my servant shall prosper or my servant shall succeed. Um, because the idea, the, the, the sense of this word that's used here, it's, it's a, uh, the idea of acting with such wisdom that you prosper or succeed. So a legitimate translation, behold, my servant shall succeed. Succeed at what, though? In verse 15, so shall he sprinkle many nations. Sprinkling the nations. Here, here's what... Uh, all Israelites at the time would have known. They would have known that sprinkling was to make clean, to purify, to make someone acceptable to God. Who? The nations. Men, women, and children from not simply Israel, not, not just us, but from the nations. That that baby in a manger would come to open the door wide to the heart of God wide to the heart of God, so that we, together, 2,000 years later, in a land that was unknown at the time, could read the words of Hebrews 10 with confidence that we, we can hear these words draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. That baby in a manger was God on a mission. Mission to do what? Make you. Make you. Invite you. Welcome you into the heart of God, into the presence of God, to sprinkle clean you. Us. The baby in a manger was God on a mission, but he was still a baby, a human, which takes us to stanza two. He came as an ordinary man. Look at, look at verse 2 in chapter 53. For he grew up like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. What, what's this talking about? What's this um, uh, young plant? What, what is this? Th- this, is, uh, this is a uh, sprout. This is referencing 
a sprout that would have popped up out of a root that was sticking up out of the ground, right? Uh, which uh, was almost, I mean, it was just common. It was ordinary. Gardeners would come, just clip it off and go on about their way. Point being that when he showed up, when he came, it was as a common, ordinary sprout popping up out of a root, not, not like some mighty oak that just appeared. Not some mighty oak that just appeared out of nowhere and went flexing from day one. But like a sprout popping up out of a root, sticking out of the ground. He came common and ordinary. And then, it says he had no form or majesty that we should look at him. No beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one for whom men hid their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. This is talking about the life of Christ. That, that he didn't show up simply as some charismatic leader, some larger than life leader that people were drawn to, that they followed off a cliff. There were plenty of leaders like that in his day. This is not some military commander who came, showed up, dominating and taking over the nations. This is not someone for whom the pain of life would not affect him. Say it this way, this is not someone who would not cry. This was someone who came and knew the pain of rejection, knew what it was like to be unwanted. And so for those of you, for those of us who have experienced the despised and rejected by men, being acquainted with grief, for those who know that pain, Jesus does too. Jesus does too. He was a deliverer who identified with his people in their pain, and this was not, this is not what they were expecting. This is not the kind of deliverer they expected to be this arm of the Lord, the manifestation of God's might and power. What they were looking for was a military leader to deliver them from the nations, and instead they got an ordinary man who came to deliver the nations. This is why Jan Oswalt would say the Christian thinks inevitably of Jesus Christ, a baby born in the back stable of a village in this man, which shake the Roman Empire, question mark. This is the advent of the man <laughs> who would be heralded the savior of the world? No, this is not what we think of the arm of the Lord should look like. We were expecting a costumed drum major to lead a triumphal parade. Came as an ordinary man. An ordinary man, not simply to come over, take over, and deliver from the nations, but to deliver the nations. The baby in a manger came as an ordinary man, yet he was God on a mission. But why? Deliver the nations, why? Stanza three. That baby came compelled by divine love. Look at verse four. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Smitten by God. You know what smitten means? It means to strike, to kill, to severely injure, pierced and crushed on the cross. Why? Why? It was for your sin, for our sin, for your iniquity, for my iniquity. And I want you to feel the shock of what this must have been like in the ancient world. I want you to feel the shock of what this was like in the ancient world, the ancient world that honestly wasn't that different from our modern world in this perspective. The ancient world, if a person was smitten, if a person was suffering, it was because they were the sinner. It was because they did something to deserve it. Clearly, this is happening to you, you must have done something to deserve this. And what does it say? Smitten by God, not because he was the sinner, but because we are. Because you are smitten by God for our. And so why did I say the baby born in a manger came compelled by divine love? It's because as overused 
as John 3.16 is. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, the son that would grow up and on his way to the cross would pray this. I in them and you in me that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you have loved me. Loved them even as you have loved me. The love of the Father for the Son being opened up and offered to you because the sacrifice of the Son standing in your gap. It was love that led the baby in a manger to the cross for sheep who have gone astray. Look at verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Listen, sheep then, I I presume sheep now, I've never actually been around a sheep. Um, Easily spooked, so the commentaries say. Easily spooked. Running in all different directions. And this is a, there's a collective and an individual sense to this text right here. The collective nature of it, Israel, if we went back to chapter one, you, you would see the metaphors of four and five, uh, verses four and five uh, throughout chapter one, talking about Israel in their rebellion, that the nation was desperately ill, the way one commentator put it, the nation was uh, a uh, mass of open sores and unbandaged wounds. A mass of open sores and unbandaged wounds, desperately in need of a savior, desperately in need of someone to come in and atone for their sin. Not, not someone to come in and simply correct their modes or methods of worship. Not simply to come in and teach them how to better apply the law, but someone to come and stand in their gap as their savior on their behalf. But there's also an individual nature to this text, right? Each one has turned to his own way. So this is true for each of us. That Israel is a picture of us, a type of us. That in our rebellion, hearts that are desperately ill, for whom our lives often feel like open sores and unbandaged wounds, in need of the same thing Israel was. Not not someone to come give four steps to healing those wounds, but someone to come and stand in the gap for uh, someone to atone for the source of those wounds. That's what we need. That's what they needed. And often for us, like sheep, fear leading us to run, fear that God won't heal or can't heal our wounds. So we turn to something that we think can. We're running like sheep when we do that. Running like sheep. We need a servant savior to come and atone for us. The baby in a manger came compelled by divine love that led him to die for us. Stanza four, it was a love that led him to die unjustly. In verses seven through nine, there's gonna be this repeated thread of oppressed and afflicted like a lamb that was led to the slaughter. Though he had not opened his mouth, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. You see, the, the picture of this stanza, seven through nine, is the picture of an innocent sufferer, the victim of injustice. I think it's really important that we don't skip over this part. I think it's really important that we don't skip over the unjust nature of what he experienced for us. And I think it's important we don't skip it over for at least three reasons. There are certainly more, but I want to give three. Reason one, the uniqueness of Advent. Listen, the uniqueness of Advent. Listen, no other religion under the sun would say, God so looked down on injustice in the world and felt such compassion that he was moved to come and experience injustice with us. Not one. Not, no, no, well, I was gonna say, actually it's not true. No other one, I should say. There is one who says that. And it's the Christian God, the God that believes, that says, that teaches that Jesus came into the world to experience the injustice of the world with us and for us. Reason two, reason two, it creates compassion for victims of injustice. Listen, 
If you don't have compassion for victims of injustice, then you simply do not understand the cross. And reason three, our own ability to navigate injustice. Listen, injustice happens on, on macro and on micro scales, right? Two groups of people and two individuals. And both groups and individuals, in order to navigate injustice, need an experience of the cross. They need the experience of what was just talked about in four through six. They need an experience of the cross. If you want to know how slaves made it through centuries of advents, go listen to the songs they sang. Go, go listen to the songs that they sang out in the fields. And, and, and here's what you'll see. You'll see a group of people who collectively had an experience of the cross. But in our own lives, we, we live with micro injustices all the time, do we not? From family, friends, coworkers, and for those of us who live day in and day out with these micro injustices, no, no matter how large or small they may feel to you, no matter how large or small they may actually be on the grand scale, Jesus is not looking down with indifference. He entered in and experienced it with you. The baby on a manger, in a manger, came into the world to embrace and experience the injustice that we live with. Not indifferent to you. Not at all. And the injustice that he embraced on the cross for you, for me, would get righted. It would be made right when he was resurrected. The resurrection is in the text. Stanza five. He came to die, but the grave could not hold him. Middle of verse 10, when his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall see his offspring. Make offering for guilt, when he dies, shall see his offspring. Listen, dead people don't see. Dead people don't see. Dead people do not see. If he died and stayed dead, this verse makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. Now listen, there is, there is, there is no metaphorical use of this Hebrew word for see right here. I, I couldn't find it in the Bible, couldn't find it in ancient literature, not, not one I could find. The, the closest thing I could find to it was this. Um, th these people had seen war. They'd seen battle. Closest thing to a metaphorical use, but even they had actually seen war. Jesus died and three days later got his sight back. Verse 10, he shall prolong his days. Listen, while the resurrection might not be explicit right there, clearly death is not the servant's end and the resurrection becomes the obvious implication. Verse 12, I will divide him a portion with the many, he bore the sin of many and makes, not made, intercession for the transgressors. This is why D.A. Carson said that while even more facets of the atonement appear in each verse of this fifth stanza, the servant's resurrection, Jesus' resurrection and triumph are clearly implied. Clearly implied. Clearly implied. And here's why it matters. There's an ad advent, the season of advent. We, we do not come together and remember a baby who grew up, died, and is dead. Advent is a making our way toward the resurrection. We begin this church calendar making our way toward Easter Sunday, but we also look back at Advent through the lens of the resurrection, through the lens of Easter Sunday. There is no second Advent. There is no return if the first Advent didn't come with a resurrection. There is no hope, there is no healing, there is no renewal of all things. There is no hope for what is most broken in your life if the first advent didn't come with a resurrection that leads to the second advent where the renewal of all things will be at hand. The first advent, we look back on it through the lens of the resurrection. 
through the lens of a Christ who is alive, through a baby who died but is not dead. And so, and so, Christmas Eve, December 24th, 5 p.m., we gather together as a church, as churches across the globe will do, prepping our hearts to wake up Christmas morning and remember a baby who died but is not dead. A baby who came as God on a mission, as an ordinary man, compelled by divine love, divine love that led him to die for others. But a baby, the one baby the world has ever known for whom the grave could not hold. That is what we celebrate and remember this Advent, next Advent, and every Advent until the second one. Let's pray. Father, we, we I pray that just just want our, our church's heart to just soar from Isaiah 52 and 53. I just want our hearts to soar. So much beauty and majesty that, can't, that we know can't come through with fallible preachers. Let us see the glory and majesty of Advent this Advent. Help us. Help us. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.